Okay, now, when we're considering the idea of can you prove out your salvation to yourself and to others uh, throughout your life, by what means, if you can, um, the specific instructions are needed to be found in Scripture for that. If you can't, uh, then we can just back off and close out this and just leave your lives the way they are, uh, especially in light of relativism today, especially in California. Uh, truth is depending upon your perception of it. So that's the idea. You, the verse Jude chapter 1 verses 3 through 4 says, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, okay, but everybody's got their perception about their own salvation. Is that true? Let's see. I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith, the faith, not your faith or your idea or perception of it, that was once for all entrusted to the saints, not out of what you think, but out of what God's word says. This passage commands all believers to refute false doctrines being taught by argument. So the relativism isn't here. It's absolute. Contend for the faith. Contend or argue strenuously, strenuously in defense of the faith, the body of truth from your own perception? No, from God's word. How do you get that? by studying it carefully via the rules of language, context, and logic. That's what we're actually arguing here. Use it, uh, the, your understanding of your faith, prove it out to yourself what it is and to others by following the rules of language, context, and logic. And every time you prepare yourself for this kind of argumentation, you actually review and refine and, and correct the misperceptions you might have yourself. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. So there are people within your congregation, and that's with every congregation, they're divisive in the sense of preaching a false doctrine that isn't in the Bible. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. Notice that author Jude provides a good reason that a believer must argue for truth in God's word because there are those amongst the body of believers as well as unbelievers in the world who live by and espouse false doctrines that must be actively and accurately refuted. They can be found in this park Fridays and Saturdays. They have a little booth and they have signs and pamphlets to hand out. And everywhere you look there's Lordship Salvation and Anti-Grace you have to work your way through into heaven and persevere in the faith. Note that those who espouse false doctrines amongst the believers may be unbelievers, as are in view in Jude 3 and 4, or they may be carnal believers, as are in view in other passages. Both types of individuals, the difference between them being often indistinguishable, are to be confronted with truth from God's word as the appropriated opportunity arises. Look at Philippians 1, 27 to 30. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a worthy manner of the gospel of Christ. What are the parameters? The gospel of Christ. How do you find it? It's in the word. By studying it, you find out what it is. Paul is commanding believers to join together in a unity in their active defense of the truths from God's word. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, will I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. There's that contending word again, striving, contending together as a unity in this case, especially for the cause of the gospel. Believers are to stand firm in one accord in their defense. To defend something, you argue its merits. They're striving to proclaim, to proclaim the truth of the gospel of salvation. They are to strive to contend, to argue for the truth of the gospel of salvation, supporting one another in this endeavor. Paul says in verses 27 and 28, which follow, that they are to do this fearlessly and boldly in the face of those who oppose, those who disagree. You don't say, let's di agree to disagree with the truth from God's word. When somebody says that, let's agree to disagree, I say, I, I can't. I can't do that. I can't violate what, what my understanding is of God's word. Now, if I am wrong, let's sit down and find out, and I'll, I'll obey. I'll, come, I'll change my point of view. But show me where I'm wrong in Scripture. And they run. This bold opposition, this fearless argumentation which believers are to do is a sign to those who have never agreed with the truth of the gospel of salvation 
that they will perish. Unbelievers are in view. It is also a sign of those objectors that the ones who have believed in the truth will be saved. So you can prove out your salvation by supporting Scripture accurately. And the way to know that you're accurate is not to read it once, it's to read it many times and prove it out and argue it and see all the possibilities when somebody raises a, an argument against what you believe, prove it out for yourself if they won't sit there with you to prove it out with them. It is inherent in Paul's command to the believers in Philippi and all believers that there surely will be an opposition, opposition which will attempt to intimidate, whoa, which will take great exception to hearing the truth, yes, and which will start an argument and be strenuously contentious to the point of personal attack on the believer, verbal or otherwise. What's ironic is they argue with you about your arguing. You're not supposed to argue, and let me argue that point. Well, that's a little hypocritical. Well, it's the shut up and listen scenario. I talk, you listen. If you uh, say anything in answer, it better repeat what I said precisely quoted or just be quiet. What happens? Whatever happens. Notice whatever happens. Paul is anticipating trouble for those who do contend for the truth of God's word. I've seen nothing but it. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man. Believers are to support one another, to be unified in their defense for the faith of the gospel. There's nothing that brings tears to my eyes better, more than a fellow brother in Christ or sister in Christ supports the point of view that's biblical. Now, I don't mean that you support what I say all the time. It may not always be biblical, but she can support it, and she, he can support it, and, and they support it from Scripture. Reaffirm what I'm saying. Wow, that's great, because then it, it seems to be overwhelming on our side. If not, I'm told to go away. The faith of the gospel, the faith, the body of truth from God's word upon which the gospel of salvation is based is the, that term, the faith of the gospel. Christians are to be unified in their defense of Bible doctrine. So, Philippians 1, 27 to 30 continued. Notice that Paul is urging the believers at Philippi and believers everywhere to contend for the faith, strive together in one accord to witness for the truth of the gospel against those who oppose its true message. The ones that are divisive are the ones who oppose the true message. We can d decide who's divisive or not by opening up the Bible. How many times have I asked and they've refused? It is truly is a striving, a contention, and arguing that Paul is urging believers to do. Paul then speaks of the faithful believer contending for the gospel of salvation with such assurance that he is tr truly is saved that his efforts serve as a sign to unbelievers of the condition of the lost and the eternal de destiny in heaven of the believer. I know one time when somebody comes at me and bumps me with his body uh, violently, assaults me, uh, and I said, is that how you defend the gospel? By beating me up? You have to go to... Uh, karate school to contend for the faith of the of the of the bible or do you you sit there and and, uh, and contend with your mouth with your eyes opened in the scripture for it has been granted to you on behalf of christ not only to believe on him but also to serve for him since you are going through the same struggle you saw i had and now i hear that i still have so a believer is to expect suffering for the cause of the gospel paul says that it will be a struggle and there will be combative opposition. And if you say that is, that's not the, shouldn't be the way, it should be loving. Well, it is loving. When you tell somebody the truth, you know, you tell somebody, hey, get out of the street, a truck is coming. Or you say, no, no, I don't want to be unloving. Let them be run over. They'll be run over with a false gospel and not make it to heaven. But in this face of this, believers are to be of one accord to support one another in their firm stand for the truth of the gospel. Today, fellow believers are more than likely to condemn the faithful Christian for causing others to have a negative reaction to truth from God's word. Well, that's not my problem. If I gave you the truth, regardless of my attitude, I gave you, I gave you the truth. And you go home and you check it out. If you don't want to check it out because you're running away from something, I, I can't create a better reaction. That's between you and God. In effect, they join the unbelieving opposition in fighting against their own Christian brothers. Scripture takes the opposite view. We believers are to join together in being ready to make a defense for truth in God's word, regardless of potential negative reaction. And we are to support one another in this endeavor. Last time I went to a booth at the swap meet, uh, a lady said, look, I know you're a believer. You can't come around here. We can't have a discussion. We can't, uh, because then 
you're wounded for unbelievers coming by. Wow, I'm not welcome as a believer in fellowship. We could support one another as as a, a team and, and reinforce the idea of the Bible. But she turned out and said, no, I just want to talk to people that will listen and won't try to uh, discuss it backwards. Well, 2 Corinthians 10, 5a, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Demolish arguments. That's not friendly, is it? Well, when you demolish your argument, how do you do it? You do it respectfully according to the rules of language, context, and logic. One passage at a time, one verse at a time, being paying careful attention to context. It's the same everywhere in the Bible. There are no differences. It's how you read a document. It's how you read the Bible. How you read a textbook in college. Carefully, from beginning to end, paying attention to the meanings of words, not adding or subtracting. T.A. McMahon states in the Berean Call, Brother, I'm not interested in any of your divisive doctrinal talk. All I care about is knowing that a person loves Jesus. If someone tells me that, no matter what church he goes to, he's my brother in Christ. Well, it didn't take, it didn't seem like the right time or place to get into an argument with this individual. Nevertheless, I felt compelled at least to get a question in before the conversation ended. I asked, when you talk with someone who tells you he loves Jesus, do you ever ask that question, Jesus who? asking questions people can say the same words and mean many different things totally out of context uh, impervious to the idea that the word can mean a number of things completely misrepresenting the word at all after quick thought the elderly gentleman let me know that he would never ask such a question it wouldn't be loving whenever i visit friends in pennsylvania there is a man whom i make it a point to see he is a joy to be with one of the friendliest men i know Though a committed Muslim, he regards himself as an ecumenist. He is proud of the fact that he shares some of the beliefs of both Jews and Christians. Occasionally, he attends a Presbyterian church with my friends and truly enjoys the experience and their fellowship. Once in a restaurant, he was expressing to me and our Christian friends his love for Jesus. The fountain just went on. Take a look. Nothing like the peace of sitting around a water fountain. So, getting back to my boysenberry pie. I felt good about my friend's expression of love when a nagging thought hit me. Jesus who? A brief mental skirmish took place over whether or not to ask such a question. My words, however, came out before my mind had settled the issue. I think the Holy Spirit was prompting him. Tell me about the Jesus you love. My Muslim friend didn't hesitate. He's the same one you love. Before I got doctrinal with my friend, I thought I should try to show him why it is, was important to make sure we were talking about the same Jesus. I used his neighbor, who was a great friend to both of us, as an example. He and only I loved the guy. After agreeing on our mutual feelings, I began to give a description of our common friend's physical attributes. He's five foot six. He's completely bald. He weighs 320 pounds. He wears a ring in his left nostril. Actually, I didn't quite get that far before objections were made. The guy said, wait a minute. He's only, he's easily over six foot four. I wish I had all his hair, and he's the thinnest man I know. My friend added that it was obvious that we weren't talking about the same person. I asked, does it matter? He gave me an incredulous look. Of course it does. I don't have a neighbor fitting your description. You may know someone else like that, but it's not my good friend and neighbor. I pointed out that if I truly believed the description I'd just given, then we couldn't possibly be friends with the same person, and he agreed. And then what followed was my description of the Jesus I knew. He was crucified and died on the cross for my sins. Did the Jesus you know do that? And the man said, No, Allah took him to heaven before the crucifixion. Jesus died on the Judas died on the cross. The Jesus I know is God himself who became a man. Is that your Jesus? And he shook his head. No, Allah is, alone is God. Jesus was a great prophet, but not but just a man. The discussion went on to many other characteristics the Bible ascribes to Jesus. It's all about context. In almost every case, my Muslim friend had a different perspective. Though he remained convinced that he held the correct view, the fact that our contradictory convictions couldn't be re reconciled and that seemed to dampen his zeal for proclaiming his love for Jesus. It's all about what the words actually say. And you have to ask questions. 
some may see my 